Hi, everybody. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback with my father's all-time, one, and one of my favorite all-time guests, Professor Kot Lakoff, back from me, back by popular demand. Now he is a TikTok celebrity, along with 18-year-old girls and people who dance. Now we have people who educate the next generation on finance. So Dr. Larry Kotlikoff of Boston University fame, who just uh, was featured in some big article telling retirees how to spend their money and just leave it a lot in cash, which I got to get that article. That was a fun article. I want to read. Yeah. What was that article? Do you know what I'm talking about? You got some national yeah, press. Was, uh, Bar I think Barron's, Barron's did a profile, and then there was some uh, – a lot of comments. Some people were uh, negative because I talked about uh, pulling out of the stock market before it crashed uh, last March, and uh, and so then there was uh, I responded to the um, to the comments. So I was like uh, on Barron's homepage twice for uh, like two days. Well, and, you know uh, what? I salute you, Larry. You know why so many people are retired? And they did sell off in COVID. And a lot of professional money managers sold off. And they didn't tell anybody. A lot of people in the know sold off because it was a scary time to be an investor. And I think what it underscores is when you're nearing retirement, you should have a certain amount of money not tethered to the market because we could have COVID. We could have some other bio weapon years from now. Um, we could have COVID, you know, Mu or Lambda or, you know, COVID Z. Um, talk about that because I, I really appreciated your honesty and I sort of agreed with you slamming the average retirement planner. I'm sure, you know, the people who were trolling you with negative comments were probably financial advisors who were unsuccessful, had, who had nothing better to do than troll you on um the article, but I really, I liked it. You were honest. Uh, wh what do you think well, about that? You know, I, I mean, I mean, uh, first of all, they, they didn't have an opportunity to hear what I really was trying to say in full because I was just, um, you know, in this profile, there were some questions. I, I gave a longer answer and the, and the reporter didn't have the space to fully convey. So I don't know whether we really had, and so, so here's what I was trying to convey that the, uh, Unfortunately, didn't get into the into the profile, which is that uh, economics tells us, finance tells us that we shouldn't try and time the market for return. That we can't that, uh, guess or we can't kind of uh, predict where the market's going to go. Uh, the market's basically a random walk, and where it's going to go depends on new information that comes in because existing information has already been processed by the market. If it's efficient, we have a pretty very highly efficient financial system. So only things that people don't know, uh, which is new news, are going to come in and change the market return, and that's not predictable. So that's why we economists think that you cannot time the market for return. On the other hand, you should time the market for risk. Finance also tells us that. So when things get riskier, when the environment, when the economic environment gets riskier, and it certainly was risk riskier at the beginning of COVID. It's still riskier, I think, uh, given that we're not out from under COVID. But when you start seeing the economy shut down, you've never seen that happen. You don't really know how many people are going to be able to work remotely. Well, they, the market's much riskier. The VIX, the um, index of risk is going up. So personally, I said, well, I'm going to do what economics says to do, which is to reduce my holdings. And sure enough, the market dropped uh, 34%. Other people pulled out. And then uh, something that I didn't really predict uh, happened, which is that the Fed came in and started buying up corporate bonds like crazy to support, in effect, the stock market. Had and that ever been done before, went, right? Uh, that was never been done. That had never been done before, correct? I'm not. Well, the I think you could argue that they did this in uh, 2008 in the Great Recession. Uh, a little bit, you know, late in the day. But that was the, the Fed age. buying treasuries. They weren't actually buying corporate bond ETFs like LQD and 
iShares and Vanguard. I mean, that was, I thought that was uncharted territory. I, th- I think there's probably been, you know, I, I think you know more, Josh, about the details of what they've been buying. But but I, I do know that in, in the Great Recession, they were buying some pretty, uh, you know, they were buying, uh, they are basically jumping in as the bank of the United, of the country yeah. and uh, making loans to uh, all kinds of entities, and uh, which I think, you know, we had a financial pro- a panic and the, and the market still dropped 53% between 2008 and the um, kind of the middle of 2009, it was down 53%. So even with the Fed coming in, there's no guarantee the market is going to go back up um, or right away. So it's a riskier situation. I pulled out. So uh, that was a, the smart thing to do. And, and uh, uh, I think that you're right. As people get older, the, they, they can't, uh, uh, you know, there's nothing. You know, most people think that um, the stock market is safe in the long run, uh, and there's this entire bucketing strategy that um, the f- conventional financial planners uh, tell their clients that, look, we're going to put this much money into stocks, and we're going to take it out 20, 30 years from now, because over the long term run, we can trust that it will be there uh, with a, de- a decent return. Well. Uh, economics doesn't tell us this. Finance tells us the opposite. When you have a random walk, things get riskier with time, not safer. And if you look at the actual cost of buying insurance against the stock market going down below a certain value, kind of buying a, a put on the market, it gets more expensive the further out you go. So the stock market is riskier, not safer in the long run. So we, we can't count on it. We just have to know that it's a, you know, it's, it's like going to the casino, but it's a casino that's not uh, geared against you, where the, where the dice are loaded against you. It's a casino with a great return on average, but a lot of volatility. And uh, when you put more into uh, into the market, your upside on average is going to be much higher. But and your downside, and the chance of your making losses will go down, but the magnitude of those losses will get bigger. That's the important thing to understand, that the magnitude, you have the fewer cases of losses, but um, when they're bad, they're much worse. So uh, we don't want to uh, be living on cat food, obviously, in old age. So we, uh, you know, putting in a, a reasonable amount in the stock market, but uh, timing it for risk, these are sensible things to do. Yeah, I don't really understand the brouhaha over the article There apparently were 200 plus comments like the first day on the article, which signals to me that financial advisors were on there who had nothing better to do to negative. But but I think you bring up so many good points because of the honesty. And I think it underscores the need for retirees to think about risk, volatility, and what you are you know, personally, everyone has to build a portfolio. I always say this, that you won't vomit out when the market goes down. And it could mean only 25% in the market or 30 or 20 or 40. And you never hear that. And that was why it was kind of cool that you were saying that. You also never hear when a guru, a finance guru gets it wrong because they are rarely honest about that because they want people to believe they are the guru or the shaman on the mountain. And I love that you were honest. So I commend you for the article. I think it was, I actually, I didn't even know about this comment thing until you told me about it. Uh, So, and I think most people, like I never read the comments because it's always trolling or something. And they're usually, uh, yeah, they're usually negative. Comments are usually negative. So (laughs) that's, if I'm featured, I'd never read a, or a negative comment. But um, just because it's like, then you're fighting the people. Although, hey, it, it probably got more publicity and they probably want you, will want you to write a follow-up on it. But I would agree that most retirement planning is wrong because they don't follow the teachings of economics. They follow math. And money is not math and math isn't money. I want to get your take on that topic. But first, we got to take our br- first break of the hour 
with Larry Kotlikoff, a guy who grew up in Jersey, came to New Jersey, and made a name for himself as uh, one of the top professors of economics in the world. So folks, if you have a question for him, go to youtube.com, search for Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback, and write it in the chat box. We'll be back in a moment. And we're back. Give us a call, 888-988-JOSH. If you want the 45-minute ultimate financial game plan for retirement or one of Professor Kotlikoff's, we'll also throw in his Maxify Planner if you want that or uh, his MaximizeMySocialSecurity.com review. So, Larry, what do you think about that? I was, I was taught by a mentor in the industry. This is when I was 23. Money is not math, and math isn't money. Comment on that. I, I love that quote. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's a good way of putting it. I mean, the um, uh, we, we're, we're focused ultimately on our consumption, and uh, we're worried about having us. We really are interested in having a smooth ride uh, with respect to our living standard. So we're not just interested in uh, finding some way to accumulate the most amount of money so that we can die with the biggest, um, you know, unspent uh, bundle of, of, of cash, so deprive ourselves our entire life. So we have to, um, you know, uh, focus on the bottom line, which is not uh, – Money per se, but it's consumption, and we want to make sure our our living standard, our consumption, is uh, steady and is uh, able to withstand shocks. Uh, you know that our our living standard, uh, if the market drops, uh, we want to make sure we're diversified so we don't have everything in the market and lose our shirt and then maybe panic and or not panic and just you know just say this is too much for me. I've got to get out, get to some safety, and then I've got a lower living standard the rest of my life, especially for somebody who's retired, who's not able to uh, recoup by working longer. So, so economics definitely, you know, we use them, you know, it's a highly mathematical subject. Every paper I write has mathematical equations at the wazoo, but they're about people's uh, con concerns about risk uh, and sustaining their living standard uh, and how they can optimally, you know, deal with the, deal with the risk, uh, and also make smart moves that don't involve risk whatsoever in terms of raising their living standard. Like, you know, you and I have talked a lot about Social Security over the years. Uh, there's downsizing your home. There's Roth conversions. There's uh, there's issues of, uh, you know, moving to states without, uh, uh, without uh, taxes. There's uh, working longer. There's all these, in terms of retirement, there's all these safe ways or relatively safe ways of raising your living standard that don't involve um, uh, uh, investment issues, and people aren't really taking advantage of those. So uh, that's one of the things I've been trying to convey. Uh, I, I wrote a, uh, I guess, uh, I, I don't know if we talked about this uh, yet, um, certainly not on online, but um, I have a book coming out called Money Magic in uh, January. It's coming out January 4, 4th, and... Uh, if people can see, I'll just show you the cover. It's a really cool cover. I'm excited about it's got, it. Um, yeah, it's got a uh, rabbits coming out of a hat. Now the rabbits are in, are origami rabbits, and uh, and the paper that they're made out of is dollar bills. We'll, we'll so show really the title. Cool show it again though, because uh, you faded out because you're in a uh, in a lab. So money. Yeah, can you see that? Oh, there we go. An economist secret. So I want to know what these. Secrets... So one of these are, and this is critical, folks. Money is not math, and math isn't money. Yes, I mean, there are formulas and stuff. But what I mean is the general, I, I, I loved the Barron's article because I would argue the general formula applied by most financial planning today. And now, I don't, I don't want to tick off financial planners watching, listening on the iHeartRadio app if you, if you miss it part of the episode, go back to iHeartRadio app, go to our Spotify app. Most people use this formula. I'm not the professor, so I'm sure you have a better formula. 
money equals rate of return, the risk you're willing to take, times the amount of money you're gonna put, wealth you're putting in, times time. Basically 99% of financial planning uses that basic formula, which to me is inherently flawed. There's no inflation, there's no taxation, there's no risk, there's no, and then there's like the risk you're willing to take, but then what is what happens when your actual, I don't know if you would call it the risk quotient or risk uh, acceptability, like when you see your actual, like you said, if you have a larger account, let's say you're worth $2 million and you had Coke stock, Disney stock in March of 2020 and you see it go down and your 2 million is 1.2. How would you feel like you came from nothing and you lost 800 grand in a month? That, you could probably make it a formula, but that's what I mean when, when I say money is not math and math isn't money. That, that money erodes over time, they're wealth eroding factors. There's all these things that people are just oblivious of from their average, I just, I really liked the article. I thought it was a good article, Larry. It, yeah, we had Barry Dyke, yeah. who, have you, I don't know if you heard of Barry Dyke, he wrote the book Pirates of Manhattan. Uh, I think I've heard of him, yeah. He I loved know, the know, article. But... Um, this guy sold 30,000 copies of a self-published book and he kind of went in and exposed like what banks were doing with their money in 06 and 07 kind of leading up to the crash. It was very interesting. And and we, we used this article because it, it, it came out right before my interview with him. I was like, this is a really good article. And he agreed and I agreed. I think the traditional, what I would call Wall Street industrial complex of funds and stockbrokers and funds, you know, they want you to have all your money in the market. <laughs> but I think a lot of people right. would benefit from an annuity or from you know, things that are more conservative, not for all your money, of course, stocks are better for the long haul, but you have to understand like what you're willing to take on with risk. And, and also what you talk about consumption with your Maxify planner, another word for consumption is right, enjoyment. You don't wanna be in not enjoying the last 10 to 20 years of your life on earth and then you die and then some ungrateful kid gets all the money and pisses it away, right? So let's talk uh, about yeah, money uh, magic. What are some money magic moves that our listeners can make now? I know we've talked about this before, but I always think they're good tips since you're usually the social security guru. Well, you know, the, well the, the book's like, you know, 300 pages and it's, kind of, it's really uh, geared for everybody. It is discussion of career choice for younger people. And uh, whether you, should, you know, one chapter is called "Don't Borrow for College." There's a chapter about um, marrying for money. There's a chapter about uh, how to get divorced, like an economist, uh, and then uh, invest like an economist. And uh, what, what does that mean? How do, what do how do we think about investing as opposed to uh, conventional planners? So, uh, and then Social Security and dealing with retirement accounts. How to uh, so. But in terms of, um, you know, some magical trick, I mean, right now, if I was thinking about investing, I would say the best investment is to pay off, if you have any student loans with high, you know, with uh, those interest rates are high, even to, even though they're being issued, have been issued by the federal government, they're typically around five. But what if Liz uh, Warren becomes the president and forgives all college debt? Yeah, I, well... I don't see that happening. I, I don't, I, you know, it could happen, but I don't, I just think that's so unlikely. Who's your, the, who's uh, your presidential life. prediction for 2024? Oh, Trump against, well, I think Biden will win. Uh, I'm more 20. Well, yeah, I think Biden will. It's going to uh, be Biden Trump again. I, I think it's going to be DeSantis versus someone else. I think Biden steps down and we have somebody else, but we'll, that'll be interesting. He'll be right. So you're calling uh, for a I mean, Biden-Trump rematch? Well, I guess, I think that's probably the most likely, but not very high probability. I mean, it's probably 60% probability that's what we'll have. Uh, and I think Biden actually is doing a good job on balance. You know, I don't think he's made any huge mistakes. The uh, We could discuss Afghanistan, what happened in Afghanistan and 
whether that could have been done better, I'm sure it could have been. But um, you know, he took he bit the bullet and got us out of there, which we had to, we should have gotten out yeah. of there 15 run in. The um, so uh, yeah, I don't want to go there. The, the withholding yeah. okay. of Regeneron. I had COVID, right? Regeneron yeah. saved my life, and they're withholding. But anyway, we don't. I don't want to get political here, but. Uh, the withholding of Regeneron, well, I think, is one of the greatest uh, misreported crises of uh, the last year. But um, they're, they're withholding it now. Well, they said they were going to ration it out of the red states because there was less vaccinated, or you know. Um, then they then they got some bad press for it, so they retooled it and said basically uh, they're distributing yeah, it. Well, but anyway, yeah. I think we'll anyway, probably. We could... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, anyway, so so uh, you know, in terms of uh, money magic uh, tricks, there's uh, clearly being patient with Social Security. Uh, for most people, we should have about 75, 80 percent of workers waiting till 70 to take Social Security. Only about six percent at most are doing that. There's a huge gain to be had there. Most people are taking their Social Security. Before they take the retirement money, it should go be exactly reversed. Uh, there's, uh, you know, people need to know about the 13 different Social Security benefits that are out there because most people, a lot of people don't know to ask for benefits that are due to them, owed to them, and then they don't get them. Uh, we have to think about, you know, Roth conversions for, uh, from your uh if you want to take your retirement account, your IRA, and traditional one uh, that's uh, taxable, pay taxes on the money, put the money into a Roth because you're worried about future uh, tax increases, that might be a smart move, but it might also kick up your Social Security benefit taxation. It may also kick up your uh, Medicare Part B premiums two years later if you're going to be, you know, because those premiums are connected to your um Modified adjusted gross income two years before. As and crazy is that, as that is, is and that's in your maxified planner, correct? Yeah, all this stuff is in the software. And the, the, what I did was, I, you know, I've spent years developing the software, and all the lessons I've learned from running the software, I put into this book because I know, you know, a lot of people like to run the software, but a lot of people just like to know what, what to do, and uh, don't have necessarily the pay the patients or interest in running software. So I try to, uh, you know, provide enough cases that um, people would see exactly what position they're in and, uh, and then know what to do uh, on any particular issue. You know, uh, there's a whole chapter here about, um, uh, about college and whether it pays to borrow money to go to college and how to, how to uh, work around, how to actually get to college without borrowing money. Well, we'll talk uh, about that when we return with world-renowned economist Larry Kotlikoff. You can go to MaxifyPlanner.com if you want to sign up on your own. It's, it's a very powerful way to plan, not just for saving money, but also income. Income is sort of the outcome, and it doesn't use outdated rules of thumb. You can go to MaxifyPlanner.com or you can call us at 888-988-JOSH and we'll throw in a Maxify Planner report customized to you and your family for free when you schedule and keep your no-obligation 45-minute ultimate game plan for retirement, 888-988-JOSH. And go over to Amazon.com, buy any of Larry's books or you get one book free by Professor Kotlikoff, whether it's on Social Security or whatever book you want. Call us, 888-988-JOSH. Now, 888-988-5674. We'll be back after these messages. And we're back. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. We're talking to Professor Kotlikoff, who created the MaxFiPlanner.com. That'll focus on giving you more peace of mind, more money, smarter decisions. And it uses the work of economics not just financial planning. A lot of these financial planning tools, they just do all these things, they tell you the pie. And what I love about your stuff is, is it's beyond that. It focuses more in real life. And a lot of times people say, well, I did a financial plan and it didn't work. 
And that's because you didn't focus on all the negative variables. So talk about that, Professor Karlikoff. First, what we, uh, the cliffhanger, what was the cliffhanger? I, I forgot it. It was college planning. And then we'll go to software construction and why most financial planning software is a little misguided. Um, what about sure. okay. college, planning for college? What are your tips there? How do you fund college? Well, Don't first go. Of all, you know, 40% of the kids who go to college, who start going, you know, start out going to college, drop out. Okay. A lot of people are borrowing a ton of money to fail out of college. So it's highly risky just to begin with, just from that, per, that single statistic to give people pause about borrowing money to do something where you were for, where before you even start out, you've got a 40% chance if you're the typical person of borrowing money for nothing except to pay the money back. Uh, and you can't get out from under it. You can't uh, uh, discharge your liability through bankruptcy when it comes to a student loan. You, they'll take it out of your payroll. They'll, they'll take it out of your check, uh, your, your wages. They'll take it out of your... Um, Social Security benefit, if you haven't paid your student loans into your 60s when you start taking Social Security. So uh, what I say is uh, don't borrow. If you're in a low-income household, your family's low income, the top schools are heavily discounting to, uh, tuition and providing grants. So the price is actually cheapest for the people that are poor. So when it comes to college, uh, the, the poor have a fantastic advantage over the rich, over the middle class and the rich. The rich uh, kids, their parents can pay whatever, so it's not an issue for them. But the middle class kids are really the ones who have to be careful. And, and what I talk about is that paying a lot of money to go to a fancy name college is just not going to pay off in the marketplace. The research that has been done by economists. Not even Boston University? Uh, well, of course, if you came to Boston University, it would pay off, but no, it, it doesn't pay off. Uh, and Boston University can be very, you know, it could be $75,000 for four years, and that's a huge amount of money for, uh, 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 for, you know, if you're upper middle class and you get no no particular grants and uh, and you're borrowing money, for, and then your parents, you borrow up to your limit, and then you're Parents are allowed to borrow up the difference. Boston and University, this just in, they just called me. They have fired you from the director of marketing. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, no. Boston University will pay off, but everything else will be, uh, don't go, Harvard is the uh, place you want to worry about. But I, look, I, I, I know people I will tell you, I'd rather my stuff. kids, I have seven kids now, Larry. We just had another one. I, I, oh, Mazel that's terrific. I'm going to go well, broke fantastic. on college. But I, I would rather my kids be educated by you than most uh, really wacky leftist economist. Uh, I don't know what the uh, what do you call it? Uh, the modern. Are you a modern modern monetary theory guy? No, these these people are uh, aren't really real economists. They're not theorists and they're not modern. They're just um, charlatans. Pretending to know, I mean, if you listen to these people, I've debated uh, the, the the supposed uh, leaders of this uh, movement, and the uh, what they say has no connection to reality. economic theory. Yeah, reality, and, and yeah, it's it's very um, very vague, and they can't write down in black in, in mathematical terms what they're trying to say, what they think is going to be true, but. What we do know that is true, and uh, this is also, you know, important to our future finances personally, is that the country is broke. The country has been running up huge bills. That um, we have an official debt that's 100% of GDP. It was 30% of GDP back in 2008. So we have, on an official basis, uh, gone crazy with our uh, borrowing. Uh, and then uh, Social Security has got about two and a half years, not 100 percent, but 250 percent of GDP unfunded liability, according to their trustees report that came out two weeks ago. So just those two things alone shows the country's bankrupt. Uh, and then you put everything else together and the picture actually looks worse.
And, and so, it looks worse when you think about the rise of CBDCs. Uh, digital currencies are really taking hegemony away from the dollar. Like we're losing our foothold. Just, People yeah. don't realize for the U.S. to be destroyed as the world reserve currency, they're not going to say uh, buy dollar. They're going to say we're going to get a basket of currencies. We're going to put a little CBDC. We're going to put a little dollar. We're going to we're going to make it more of the dollar. So the dollar is going to get 90 percent at first and then 80 and then 60 and then all of a sudden it'll be 10 percent. And and people don't realize that will be destruction for the U.S. economy that we've never seen. Uh, what, what say you about that? So I think the country's bankrupt, and I think the country has been printing money out the wazoo. The Fed has been, you know, uh, the the amount of money that they printed is uh, six times the the stock of what, what what's called base money is six times bigger than it was in 2008. So we've had this enormous expansion of the of money printing. At the same time, the country's borrowing. So a lot of what's going on here is that the Treasury borrows money and then the Fed prints money to buy up the bonds that the Treasury just sold to the private sector. So it's really just the government printing green dollar bills, in effect, electronically to buy stuff or to give give people, give uh, certain people money. And countries that engage in uh, in monetary, in, in money printing to pay for their bills uh, end up with inflation, and we're starting to see that happen. Now, a lot of people think the increase is, uh, you know, temporary and that it's due to bottlenecks, and surely that's uh, surely a part of it. But the uh, there's a basis here in underlying the system, given how much money has been printed in recent uh, decades for a hyperinflation, really. So I'm somebody who's very concerned about the long-term uh, you know, when you set, when you have the trustees report telling us we've got a $59 trillion unfunded liability mm. and it's in table 6F1 of the trustees report and they hide it in the appendix and nobody in the – none of the trustees uh, will talk about that. Even in the report, in the, front, in the summary of the report, they ignore entirely the most important table in the, in the trustees report that says we're two and a half years broke just from Social Security – of GDP, uh, you know, we've got a problem. Mm. Uh, when we can't pass this infrastructure bill, uh, when that becomes, uh, you know, somehow too expensive to, uh, uh, and we can't invest in, uh, in a decent education system. I'm speaking to you now, as you know, from Switzerland, I'm here uh, giving some lectures for the month and you know, the difference in infrastructure when you drive around Germany or South Korea or Switzerland, if you, you know, when you're, uh, I get to fortunately get to go to lots of countries and just uh, the degree to which these countries have their acts together, the degree to which they provide decent education to their ki kids, the degree to which they treat everybody uh well, so that there's not people that are kind of living on the street starving. Uh, the cleanliness of the place, uh, it's just amazing. It's like day and night compared to where we are in the U.S. So we are, uh, as you said, we, we are at the end of our economic empire, as far as I can tell. We're, yeah, and then the other thing is that, you know, if you look at the projections that I've done and others uh about where China will be at the end of the century versus the U.S., their 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 economy will likely be twice as large as ours, if not even larger, as a ratio. So the U.S. is heading towards second-rate uh, economic status, and we're not going to be able to police the world. We're seeing our pull, pulling back on that, and you're saying that the dollar is going to likely not become, you know. It's not, it's going to lose its place as well. Well, I mean, talk to a kid, stuff. talk to your students, right? They don't believe in the dollar anymore. They believe in Bitcoin. They believe in cryptocurrencies, all of these things. You know, it's, it's not like pe people don't want dollars anymore, right? I mean, I want your take uh, on yeah, that. I think, yeah. Actually, when we return, well, I was just, I, oh, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll sure. hold that thought. That'll be the cliffhanger. Uh, Kotlikoff okay. on crypto and Bitcoin. When we return, 
This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. And call us now, 888-988. Josh, for Professor Kotlikov's book on Social Security or the Max5Planner.com or get your own customizable Social Security report on MaximizeMySocialSecurity.com. Free when you schedule and keep your no-obligation review at 888 josh Pre-order Money Magic. Can that be pre-ordered yet or not? Not yet. Uh, yeah, if you just go to kotlikoff.net, there's a link. Um, go to kotlikoff.net right. and pre-order. It is one of my... Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this book. Uh, um, it's going to be exciting. Okay. You're going to get an autographed copy, Josh. Good. To give the little Josh, who's going to be class of whatever, 2040 at, at Boston University. As long as you're yeah, around, my, uh, you got to stay alive that long. Yeah, no, not to worry, but seven kids, that's a great achievement. Fantastic. It's wonderful. It, it, kid, kids are just so fun. It's, uh, yeah. it's tiring, but it, they're such a blessing. I mean, they just, they're, uh, my, my oldest three, because my wife does such a good job with them. They read a book a day, like big books. They're learning Latin at 13. I'll, I'll talk more about my kids' education. When we return, 888 josh We'll be back after these messages. And we're back. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback with Professor Kotlikov. So we had a cliffhanger, and I started talking about my kids, so I forgot the cliffhanger again. What was it? That's about big, about the cryptocurrency. You know what it is? It's COVID brain. I got COVID. A little yeah. bit. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit off How are you feeling? a step. Better. How, how have you been? How long have you had? When did you have it? I had it September 2nd. I tested positive. I want to say the 6th got or 5th got regenerate on the 6th. Uh, I could not breathe. I mean, I'm fairly young. I couldn't breathe. So oh boy. I felt like I was going to die. It was very bad. And I went to the hospital and then me wait for seven hours. By the way, there, there's a solution to COVID um, in, in terms of the hospitals. Basically, I knew a nurse at this particular hospital. We were on vacation and I said, uh, is it okay to go to the hospital? I said, you really need to go to the hospital. We have Regeneron. You got to get Regeneron. It, it works. It's like a wonder drug. So I went, they made me wait seven hours. And everybody, half the people had COVID and half the people were like little old ladies. I mean, you felt bad for them. I was like, I was going to say, leave. You're, you're going to get COVID. Get out of here. And I go, can I go to my car so I don't get this 92 year old woman coming in for pacemaker adjustment COVID they go no first come first serve if you go to your car you lose they should have a very established if you have COVID you wait in your car and then you get a room and they should have a COVID floor so I knew that this hospital had so many open beds because it was like a kind of a podunk hospital in Cape May New Jersey uh, no offense if you're from Cape May but I know you're from Canada but it was like a little bit backwards, but my uh, my wife went there for something that had success. They actually medevaced her to Cooper in Camden, where you're from. Uh, so I, I respected that if I was really a problem, they would medevac me. Where some of those hospitals, anyway, they don't they don't ship you out if you really need to. So I went there, and she's like, "Yeah, they have all wing of people are open." So they what they should have done was had a COVID wing. They didn't. Yeah, they lumped absolutely. All the COVID people with the regular people and everybody's coughing. And oh boy. and so they talk about people dying in hospitals. That's were you why vaccinated? Could, what's up? Were you, were, you, were you vaccinated? Was I vaccinated? No, I wasn't. And that was another thing. If you weren't vaccinated, they wanted you to die. So I think that they made me wait seven hours because I didn't have the vaccine. And, um, you know, anyway, How, how's your wife? How's your wife? Thank the Lord. Okay? My wife was great. All my kids were great. Yeah. They probably all got COVID, but one showed like very bad flu like symptoms. The oldest, 
uh, the one who tested positive, the rest all tested negative, but one of my sons who tested positive, he had zero symptoms. So it seems to like certain, meaning like um, the host, I don't think it has any corollary to whether you're fat or, or all that stuff. People say, well, you're old. I think it has to do, like I had asthma as a kid and it seemed to attack what was weakest. Oh. So it felt like an asthma attack on Mach 10. And um, like oh they didn't God. even give me a nebulizer. God, okay. What's up? So you're, you're doing pretty well now though, huh? Thank God, yeah. I had a great COVID doctor. They gave me, I got prednisone. I got z pack. They gave me ivermectin. They gave me, what's the other thing? Hydroxy. They gave me everything. And um, because I, I was pretty bad, and um, I lost my voice. Still, I, I, I uh, they say that could be long, like effects of long COVID, but COVID is no joke. And then we we've uh, had a report of a of, of a dear f friend who lost their daughter, forty three to COVID. So I don't think it's you know people got to get it through their heads. It's not age determined. And by the way, we had socially distanced, even still. And I got COVID because I contact trace everyone in my office. I'm very anal about this. Um, I got COVID, I think from my sister who already had the vaccine. So uh, I think it was Delta because the, the studies I've done. But anyway, they don't even ask you, was it Delta or not? And frankly, they don't even ask you when you go in the hospital, if you were truly vaccinated or not, you could lie and tell them no or yes. And they, they're not like checking a card. Um, and then, yeah. Uh, but anyway, the Regeneron thing, if you know anybody gets COVID, you got to go before you get pneumonia or else they won't even give it to you once you get that far. But anyway, sorry on my. Uh, yeah, that's the uh, monoclonal antibodies, right? Yeah. That's what you mean by Regeneron. That was like, yeah. A life changer but uh you know in, in one sense to be honest i'd rather have gotten the vaccine than it had covid really bad for two weeks so um what's also interesting oh go ahead no, no you go ahead sorry what also is interesting i think everybody needs to get the booster who got it before because i don't think the the old i don't think the vaccine i think the old vaccine works against alpha i don't really think it works against delta because because of the reports i've been hearing like 50 60 percent of the people who have it are vaccinated now so it's uh but it's uh, yeah it's a whole but but it, but apparently the results from uh israel say that if you got the vaccine you're eight times less likely to die than if you did but then i read some report it was four times from uh Penn Medicine did a study, um, but that's the problem. We don't have a central repository of data, so we're we're just living in the world of like fake news. You don't know whose data to trust. I, I tend to trust the Israeli data. Where do you go for data? Well, I actually agree with you. I think they probably have the be the best uh, information, and certainly they've had they've had four different waves of this. This is even though they've. Uh, got probably one of the highest vaccination rates in the world. Uh, so this thing is just a, a real bitch, uh, this pandemic. And I think everybody knows people have died or gotten pretty, close, pretty sick. And um, uh, some, we, we have a, had a, a neighbor across the street. She, <laughs> they got the vaccine. One, he got the vaccine. 12 hours later, he passed away. He had a, uh, his heart stopped working. Uh, he, he had a pacemaker, and I think he had a reaction. Uh, we think he had a reaction to the vaccine. I'm not saying to anybody they shouldn't take the vaccine because I think, on balance, the evidence is clear. People should take the, va the vaccine, uh, but uh, it's a risky world either way. Uh, yeah, I, I, because you know. here's the thing: I, I understand why. You know, if you look at the. It's interesting. I take all these holistic things, you know, the quercetin, the D, the C, the zinc, none of it were a match for COVID. COVID was just ripping through my body. It was like I was taking 12 quercetin a day. I was taking 10,000 IUs of D, 50,000. At one time, I was taking the zinc. I was taking the C. 
I, I mean, COVID was stronger than all of it until I got the Regeneron. And surprisingly, even though it's controversial, my doctor gave me the ivermectin and the, um, the hydroxychloroquine and the prednisone. And that along with the Regeneron, that was the thing that stopped it. But I was getting that, that lymphocyte, whatever that thing is, it like takes over your lungs. I was feeling that it was bad, <laughs> but thank God. Yeah. I, I can swear by my, my doctor was awesome. Every other doctor you'd call them, they go COVID, they go, we don't want to see you. And I called this doctor that a friend gave me, Dr. Eck, who's apparently like this world famous COVID doctor in New Jersey. And I didn't know. And they call me like every night, how you doing? And gave me more stuff so that, hey, maybe they saved my life. So, so. Doctors are the best. Uh, doctors and nurses, these people are really just amazing. And they, they are real heroes. There's no question about it. Thank God. So this was a fun um, little COVID detour. But up next, we're going to talk yeah. more with Professor Kotlikoff about whatever his thoughts are on the economy, portfolio construction, money magic tips, and more. This is Josh Jelinski. And folks, call us 888-988-JOSH, 888-988-5674. And you get the free gift, which could be the MaximizeMySocialSecurity.com. Folks, if you have a decision to make on Social Security, it is the best software out there for that. Maxify Planner is one of the best financial planning tools I'm aware of. That's maxifyplanner.com. You can buy it yourself or you can get it free when you schedule and keep your no obligation. Maxify review. Call us now, 888-988-5674 and go over to kotlikoff.net and pre-order his book, The Money Magic Book. So folks, Kotlikoff is spelled K-O-T-L-I-K-O-F-F.net. When we return, this is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. Don't touch that dial. And we're back with Professor Kotlikoff. So you were saying, before we got on this COVID detour, where were we? Uh, I think you wanted to talk about cryptocurrency for a bit. Yes, crypto. And, uh, and oh, yeah, and then it was like COVID brain. We got on the, but I'm telling you, man, it, it, uh, it's funny. So... Crypto, yeah, yeah, what's your take on Bitcoin, crypto, all that stuff? I just thought like that's a sign that the dollar's kind of losing its like now it used to be like people would want no, let me tell you, let me tell you about an interesting uh dinner I, uh, I had the other night with the former uh, vice uh director uh, of the like vice president of the um Swiss Central Bank. This was just like two nights ago. And we were talking about uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, and uh, he he said that he feels that uh, that he thinks that uh, uh, governments, including the Swiss government, will issue their own digital currency, and that because of the um, the blockchain technology, that uh, that if they want to make a let's say a transaction with a Chinese, a big Swiss company wants to uh, make a transaction now, they have to go from Swiss francs into dollars and ended up from dollars into yuan and uh, uh, and and that, that uh, in order to, let's say, to get product from Ch China or, or the other way around if, if uh, money's going from China to um, to Switzerland. And he says that's expensive and, and uh, uh, you know, you uh, cumbersome and that, that that's going to go away. And, and what what because the central banks are going to be issuing their own digital currency and they're just going to be able to swap their digital currency one for one directly without this uh, kind of intermediary which is the US dollar so what you were talking about uh the hegemony of the US dollar the dollar being the world's reserve currency slipping and sliding away through time i think is true so i would say to people uh, that plus the uh, the fact that we're having inflation should pe make people uh, you know aware of the fact that the dollar is likely to lose ground over time. They might want to buy the Canadian dollar, uh, which is pretty weak, uh, but it, you know it's not likely to. Canada's got a much better uh, managed economy and fiscal system, and uh, central bank in terms of. Uh, it's got much more control, I, I think, of its money supply 
terms of not printing money every two, two seconds. So buying the French, uh, I mean, the Canadian dollar uh, might be a good hedge against uh, U.S. inflation. It's one idea. Uh, but anyway, this is an interesting uh, point of view uh, from somebody in the, in the know. Yeah, that, uh, that, that scares uh, me. He, when, when someone in the know backs up what I think, that's like, ooh. Because there's this... Yeah, no, it, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, he doesn't think that the uh, the Bitcoin and the, the non... that the private, if you like, uh, digital currencies had much of a future. He, he was of the view that uh, state-run digital currencies would... Uh, come into being and that they would dominate and that the other, uh, you know, Bitcoin and, and other, the other 999 <clears throat> uh, digital currencies that, that people have floated out there will disappear through time. You know, we had, let me just give you an analogy. We had during the Great Depression, this will, you'll find this very interesting, I think. I found it fascinating. But we had uh, 3,000 different currencies printed by local Towns and uh, and uh, state governments in the Great Depression. Uh, so you had towns who were printing money, stamping the back of pieces of bark from trees uh-huh. with some stamp, and that was they were using that to buy things uh, for the government, and that the bark was circulating as money. So we had like three thousand uh, different currencies. So the idea that we have a thousand cryptocurrencies out there yeah it it can happen uh, because we've seen it happen in the great depression a very similar thing Uh, we saw california when it got into trouble um, a decade or so ago uh, in effect print print its own money it would pay state employees it couldn't pay them dollars on time so it paid them orange ious or ious on the state of california it was no no different from, from printing its own money now they were ultimately able to, you know, buy back those IUs and make good, but um, uh, you know, in general, uh, lots of currencies cannot coexist. Uh, you really don't need to have a zillion currencies out there in order to do transactions. You just, uh, yeah, and, but you also don't need the dollar. No, I agree. I, I mean, I sort of think ninety-nine percent of the cryptos will fall away. I, I do think. Probably Bitcoin will remain as sort of the digital gold, if you will, because of the mass. Uh, you know, you look at Guggenheim, you look at a company called Nidig. You, a lot of these big banks and Wall Street firms are now getting their own Bitcoin funds. Fidelity came up with Fel- Fidelity Digital Assets. Isn't that up in Boston by you? Uh, sure. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I think... I do see most of the cryptocurrencies going away and sort of coming uh, what what some call the Bitcoin standard, where Bitcoin would almost serve as like a world reserve asset where you might have like a bank might have 3% of their balance sheet in Bitcoin. And then you might have the CBDC of a particular country. Um, I probably could see a, a Bitcoin slash CBDC world maybe ethereum because of the the art thing although that to me i you know i don't i don't get 99% of the of the cryptocurrency world i, I i've researched only you know bitcoin cuz it makes sense to me the others don't what um what do you think about bitcoin or do you, he didn't give any he doesn't think much of it well i think he thinks these things will ultimately go away and that uh, the swiss digital currency and the, you know, the British Bank of England's digital currency, there'll be enough digital currencies that people have more confidence in that these other currencies will lose value and uh, just, you know, you know, it's a, it's a highly risky investment, let's put it that way. The uh, uh, better you should buy, put your money into your, into a renovating your home or <laughs> Buying a, a car that you can sell in a in a pinch, uh, or something something durable, especially in the context of potential inflation, uh, and I think that we're seeing that. You know, we're seeing durables and house prices going up uh, during the last year or so. So, 
Yeah, uh, who would have thought my yeah. van that I bought yeah. for my seven kids, right? Bought it for 40 grand, get the taxes and fees, it's 45. Guess how much that van would go for today, Larry? How much? 69,000. Oh my God. I'd sell it. Buy, <laughs> sell it and buy, uh, <laughs> I don't know, You get, take Ubers. Yeah, there for $69,000, you might as well just take Ubers. Well, no, that would be too uh, expensive. My wife carting around the kids to soccer and baseball. And... That's amazing. It, it, I, I would have bought a fleet. By the way, there was a man in Utah who saw this coming. He bought a fleet of these vans. His name, It's like Tim Dolly uh, Nissan in Utah. The guy bought up every one of these vans that existed. In the country. And, then, and now you're selling them. Okay. And it's a discounted van. You know those big old Nissan boxy vans? Yeah. That are like mm -hmm. massive. They take up, you know, that that's us in those vans. So, but thank thank God we got it yeah. when we did because, man, I wouldn't want to spend 60. Now, but, but let's say I sell that van now. I guess I could buy a Ford Transit, but I don't, they're, I think they're going for like 55, 60 grand right now. Can you believe that? A Ford Transit. The old work trucks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think at this point it's uh, not the time to be buying uh, vehicles given their pricing. That they're going to come, those prices will come back down to something reasonable in a, in a year or two. Uh, people should just hang out in their car, mm -hmm. regular car. You know, it's just too expensive. And probably also the case with housing has gotten pretty dear. Uh, so people have to be aware that this is, you know, these kinds of price increases are not going to be permanent. Yeah. Uh, I don't think, so I think the housing market, especially in the Northeast, it boomed because everybody wanted out of New York city where we are. So they moved to New Jersey, but after a while, people get sick of paying 10 cents on every dollar to the state government. They're moving to Florida. They're moving to Texas. They're moving that is a fundamental crisis with state governments. Do they seek you out? Because I know you're sought after by certain people in government. I would love to be a partisan council because I love New Jersey. I think if New Jersey had like a 5% state income tax, people wouldn't move or a 4%. But 10, 10 10.97 for my cup. People, if I moved, you know, the minute my wife says we can move, we're moving. And I'll run my company out yeah. of Pennsylvania and drive over, you know, if, if need be. What, um, do they seek you out for that? I know you're an economist of some renown, or, or do they? Well, I've, yeah, I mean, I've done consulting for, and I've talked to state treasurers, and um, uh, I've had, you know, talked to the Ways and Means Committee of the, of the um, House of Representatives. They, they write the tax laws. So, I've been around lots of state and federal tax issues, and absolutely we have, you know, in addition to going broke, where we have so many people facing such high disincentives to working, you've got the poor in large part trapped in poverty because they earn money, they lose food stamps, uh, housing support, welfare benefits, Obamacare subsidies or Medicaid uh, benefits, uh, the list goes on, and then you know, we've got uh, high-income people facing uh, the high, you know, 35% federal br bracket. It can be 13% in uh, California. And then you've got, we, we have to remember there's sales taxes in every state that's in effect a tax on working. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of Democrats would like to put the high, very high earners, people earning over 400000 uh, have them pay 12.4 percent more on their on their payroll, so they'll be like a 70 percent tax bracket in two, and, and then they'll stop working and move to a different country. So we have to rationalize the the tax system, get the ta the, the incentives to work down. Uh, I mean, uh, up the incentive to work, the net incentive up, the disincentive down. But we also need to get more revenue, and we need to cut spending. Uh, you know, the the Federal spending on healthcare, the way it's organized, is just uh, 
it's not that we shouldn't be giving everybody having uh, health, health insurance through the federal government, but we have to do it in a way that's affordable. So, you know, Josh, I ran for president. I'll, I'll leave you with this because I'm going to have to head off, but I do have a book called uh, You're Hired, which is at kotlikoff.net, and it's a free download. And, uh, you know, I wrote that that's as my platform. That's my platform when I ran for president. Is back Biden adopting your platform? No, I don't think uh, neither Trump nor Biden uh, have read this book. But and, even though even uh, though you were a Biden fan, they, they didn't come. At, did they talk to you after they found out you were uh, supporting him in the election or not really? Did somebody call you and say, hey, we want you to be on our Council of Economic Advisors? Uh, no, nobody's, uh, nobody's called the, um, uh, Hey, at least they, Trump they called have... you. Didn't they call you from the Trump administration when everything was going to hell? They didn't well, listen. I, I did some, uh, I, I did some, I, I did get, I do have a, a buddy who was in the pretty high up in the Trump administration. We, and I was trying to help with, uh, COVID testing. The testing they should have listened uh, to you. That was, that was a good, that was a good prescription. We we had yeah. you pushing that. Still, we have these home t- tests now that the FDA has approved. I think something or CDC, some like six different tests. You can buy, go to the local Walgreens, and buy these uh, Abbott Binex now tests. Uh, they should. The, what the federal government should be doing is using the Defense Procurement Act to make zillions of these home tests and give everybody a year's supply. In Switzerland, you get like a month supply. Of, you get five tests for free every month. Uh, but in the U.S., imagine everybody could take a, a, a for 15 minutes a day, you take a test absolutely free at home. They just put a little swab in your, you know, you put a little swab in your nose. doesn't hurt. You don't have to push it up high. And you just see if you're, if you're, um, clean and then yeah i was a big fan uh, of that a year and a half ago no, nobody bought on to that yeah and it's but we could get covid over in a in a couple of weeks if we just got everybody this thing these tests uh that you can buy in the drugstore but they're too expensive in the drugstore so <laughs> there are so many sensible things we could do and would do if i were president but unfortunately that didn't happen and so we're bipartisan uh, so We'll leave it at that. I know you got to go. Thank you so much for joining us. Anything you want to plug before you go? I just want to plug your good health and uh, and uh, congratulations on this on the seven kids and congratulations on surviving COVID and stay well. Yeah. Th- okay. Thank God. So thank you for joining us. Yeah. Kotlikoff.net. and folks, call us now eight 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 nine eight eight Josh, and you get your choice of either the Maxify Planner the Social Security Maximizer tool, or one of Professor Kotlikoff's books. When you schedule and keep your no-obligation review, calls today, 888-988-JOSH. And for more of Kotlikoff's work, go to K-O-T-L-I-K-O-F-F dot com. Thanks for joining us. This is yeah, Josh Jelinski, the Financial Quarter. Oh, final talk, thought? Just it's j- j- dot net, not dot com. Dot net. Dot net. Dot net. Thanks so much, Larry. Hope to have you on soon. Thanks. Okay, Josh, you take care. The preceding program was sponsored by the Jelinski Advisory Group. Any awards, rankings, or recognition by unaffiliated third parties or publications, including Five Star Wealth Manager, Advisory of the Year finalist by Senior Market Advisor, and Top of the Million Dollar Roundtable, are in no way indicative of the advisor's future performance or any individual client's investment success. No award, ranking, or recognition should be construed as a current or past endorsement of Josh Jelinski or Wealth Quarterback LLC. Information regarding specific awards, rankings, or recognitions is available on the Wealth Quarterback website at www.jelinski.com. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. Investment strategies such as asset allocation, diversification, or rebalancing do not assure or guarantee better performance and cannot eliminate the risk of investment losses. There are no guarantees that a portfolio employing these or any other strategy will outperform a portfolio that does not engage in such strategies. This broadcast should not be construed by any client or prospective client as a solicitation to affect or attempt to affect transactions and securities or the rendering of personalized investment advice. 
advice. Due to various factors, including changing market conditions, the information discussed in this broadcast may no longer be reflective of current positions or recommendations. While information presented is believed to be factual and up-to-date, Josh Jelinski and Wealth Quarterback do not guarantee its accuracy, and it should not be regarded as a complete analysis of the subjects discussed. The tax and estate planning information discussed is general in nature, is provided for informational purposes only, and should not be construed as legal or tax advice. Listeners should consult an attorney or tax professional regarding their specific legal or tax situation. Advisory services offered through Wealth Quarterback, LLC.